Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Is the chef an artist or an artisan? For my new guest today, Chef Andrew McLeod from Avenue M in Asheville, North Carolina. Cooking is an exercise in practicality, not creations from an artist. Welcome to episode 59 on the Flavors Unknown podcast. I am your host, Emmanuel Laroche, and I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I interview trending chefs, pastry chefs, and mixologists from around the country. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to it and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown, and you can find the show notes from this episode and all the other episodes on the website flavorsunknown.com. Chef MacLeod will talk about the challenge of launching a new menu when restaurant has an established customer base, his passion for salumi and pasta, his work with his mentor, Sean Brock, and the support needed for hospitality professionals who struggle with substance abuse and addiction. Hi, Chef. Uh, welcome to Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you on, uh, on the show tonight. Um, thanks for Emmanuel. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. How are you navigating the current situation with, uh, with the pandemic? Personally, 2020 has been, a, been a, a really good year for me, if I'm speaking objectively. You know, I've had I've, I've had a lot of great strides in my in my personal life and 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 professional life. A lot of things that I've that I feel that I've worked for a really long time for are seeming to kind of materialize around me, and it's a it's a really inspiring time. The first part of the year was obviously really tough. I moved back to Asheville, which is where I'm originally from, in January, right at the first of the month, and I started up at the restaurant in uh, about the middle of the month, and when we redid the dining room. Had a, had a little bit of a time about about five weeks before our realities all changed. Yeah, you you guys like closed the restaurant after that, right? Like um, probably yeah, around March. We were down for two two months, two full months. So we we came back the last week of May. So we really kind of kind of look at our 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 year and our whole relationship with me and this restaurant starting in June. It doesn't make sense to kind of lump in that first little bit with what we're with what we're doing now and where we are you know so north carolina we're allow, allowed 50 percent re restaurant occupancy for dine-in service and our, our restaurant is uniquely positioned a lot differently than most of them in our city we're, we're located in north Asheville, about two miles north of downtown and so our, our building used to be a mountain climbing store and you know a lot of other things in the past and it's just shy of six thousand square feet so with the social distancing guidelines in, in place, we can still seat about 100 people at a time. We're really lucky in a lot of ways, uh, uniquely to us, because a lot of, a lot of our, our colleagues, especially downtown, are in much smaller spaces with much more limited seating capacity where, you know, they really have to rely much more heavily on, on carry out and delivery, which, you know, we, we have those platforms too. It's just that we're, we're in, a, in a unique situation where we can spread everybody out and have really high ceilings and, and things can be, can feel a little bit more safe from a consumer perspective. Okay. You know, Avenue M, that's the name of your restaurant. It's like, um, you know, it's not like a new restaurant in, in Asheville. Of course, it's been there for, you know, about 10 years and it's a neighborhood restaurant where there is a lot of like locals that are having their, you know, their favorite um, item on the menu. So I'm just curious that you said that, you know, you, you started in at the beginning of the year. So how did you approach the creation of uh, the menu when, when you open at the time? Initially, my, my plan was to, to come in and fly under the radar for a little while, just kind of get used to back in, being back in town and who was growing and, and what was really what had changed from you know, the 10 years since I've been gone about the food scene. And we didn't, we didn't plan on doing any press you know, initially or talking about the changes of the restaurant. We just kind of wanted to do things a little bit more piecemeal and gradually over time. Prior to Avenue M in 2010, the building was a restaurant called Usual Suspects. And that was a more of a bar and had, it had a late night menu and they would show screen movies in the back. 
it, it was a real popular industry hangout. When I was starting out as a cook at, at the Grove Park Inn, that was a, a popular late night spot for us where we would get off of work and go over there for a nightcap and hang out. And there was a lot of other industry folk that, you know, there was the Biltmore team that would come there and there was, you know, some of the downtown people would, would trickle through that lived on that side of town. And so there was a lot of things about the nostalgia of the space for me and, and my partner, Ralph, who was a sommelier at, at Grove Park for a long time. There was a lot of, of things about the nostalgia of the space that we wanted to pursue. Uh, we, we were planning on, you know, launching a late night menu and doing all that stuff in May and just had those kind of, kind of plans to get back to some of the roots of the building. And Avenue M, when usual suspects transitioned into that and they did that rebrand, it turned into over time a um, very much a neighborhood restaurant, much less of a bar atmosphere and the local neighborhood community that, that sustained them for that, that period of time primarily consisted of everybody living in, in North Asheville and the Beaver Lake community. They ended up getting really set in, in their ways and, and, and some certain things in terms of the food. And so, you know, I, I came in and, and I saw a three page menu and it was a kind of a shock to the system in a few different ways. I poured through a lot of sales data to see what it was that people liked about the place. And, you know, Tony and Ralph, they, they bought the restaurant in June of 2019 when I was still in San Francisco. Everything that they told me about what they had seen was that people were ordering off the specials menu more than anything because they would come in every week and they would, they would have the same thing and they were just getting kind of tired of having the same thing. So I didn't really think that there was that much that people were holding on to. I thought that, that we could change the way that we were purchasing and change the quality of the food and let that speak for itself and let that be what we establish our, our trust building exercise on, I guess. When I started my, my very first week in the kitchen after we did the, the remodel in the dining room, you know, I said to myself that I wasn't going to change anything. I wasn't going to do anything. I was just going to expedite and I was going to see how everybody was running. Uh, they see how they were serving food, how they were just how the place was operating, you know, and there were four seamals on the line and the way that they, the, how, how hard these guys were working to put out this really poor quality food was just a real shock to me, you know? And so I put my foot down and I said, I'm, I'm not going to be a part of this. Let's, let's just do it now. You know, <laughs> this wait in three months stuff, doing things one thing at a time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a part of it, you know? So we, we changed the brunch menu and we changed the dinner menu in a week. We didn't do the work of getting the message out there that this is what we were doing or who I was or, you know, really who Ralph and Tony was and why we're credible people to be doing this to this place that meant so much to all these people and means so much to all these people. So there was a significant portion of people that were just angry that we changed anything, you know, that were just angry that they couldn't get the thing that they had always gotten. To. Yeah. Yeah. And there was, you know, a significant portion of people that were, they were really happy that, that there was some new life being breathed into the place. But the people that were the loudest were the ones that were upset that things were different, you know? And so in a lot of ways, the, the shutdown allowed us a really great opportunity to reset sure. and, yeah. and kind of get some clarity on the kind of culture that I wanted to build in the kitchen and how, how we, I wanted that to build throughout <laughs> the operations of the restaurant. What was really important about this place and what's really important about the hospitality business. It was an opportunity to, to kind of re, retool my thinking that coming back and, and just doing to-go service for a little while and then getting back into a dine-in a, in a really limited way with a really pared down menu, bringing back a lot of these old dishes, I really felt that this was an opportunity to be of service to my community and give people something that, that they want. Whether or not I agree with whether it's objectively good or not is not really the point at, at this time sure right, exactly and and i guess during the that situation people are more uh, into like um you know comfort food and so i'm guessing like the old classics that were on the menu resonated with them you know that yeah point. and and you know we were sourcing our products differently and we were obviously executing them in a way that was that was at a higher level than they had been previously so we we were having a lot of a lot of success with that how did you identify those, um, you know, those classics that were on, that were on the menu? Well, we just looked at past sales data. Okay. You know, at what what the things that that percentage wise, off of this, you know, really large menu that they had that were sold the most of in that building, and you know, it was about five or six five or six key items that have really stuck around. And we've done a lot of work since then, in in, in terms of getting getting a flow about how I really 
cook and how my team cooks where it's it's a little bit more nimble and market driven and you know it's driven by what is available from the small producers around and and we kind of take that and and flesh that out into what it's going to look like ultimately on the plate and and a well-rounded balanced dish so that's really occupying most of our menu space now um we're, we're in a position where we have the the neighborhood classics available and this is on a uh, on a separate um so sheet. can you give give us some example of those um of those classics the big three are the or were the three entrees the chicken piccata you know a seared salmon with pesto sauce and a uh a medallion beef merriman medallion was what they called it is is a a terrace major that at least that you know has a, has a demi glace sauce and, and mashed potatoes those are the biggest ones So how did you balance like the the business need to keep those classics on the menu and and obviously your desire to add like your own like creations? Well, we just started them slowly, you know. We gave them the space on the on the menu that hey, these are these dishes that that identify this place to you and so they're not going anywhere, you know. I just started implementing things and, and cooking like I normally would. I just didn't have the full menu. I just didn't have enough of space for everything. I you know, I heard your word use the word creations and it brings up something that that I think is a, a a little bit of a a misnomer for a lot of chefs and cooks and things like that like I don't view a dish as something that I created or that we as a team created or that comes in inherently from a creative place like I I really feel like cooking is at least in the in the way in which we go about it is an exercise in practicality Can you explain that to me? What do you mean by that? Traditionally, probably in the last 20, 30 years or so, ever since the the food agricultural system has has really exploded in all directions, any chef anywhere in any hotel or any restaurant can sit down and write a menu and just kind of p- pull out of the sky whatever ingredient they want and go across any number of box truck purveyors and and bring those products in and execute that dish. And what really it always was before this agricultural system took shape in our country was looking to what was around you, you know, the local local food scene, what what people are growing locally within, you know, reasonable distance for you to for you to find those products and that be the driving force behind what you cook. And a, a lot more people take that approach now. There is a, a large period of novelty about the farm to table movement and about responsible sourcing and about this and that whatever and and it it seems ad nauseum to me because my understanding of a chef is this is what you do that you you source the best product that you can um from the best place that you can and that's your responsibility to figure out how to how to translate that into something that somebody wants to eat so it it doesn't seem to me that 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 that's inherently creative or special or you know worthy of being put in these categories that it's often put that I often see it put in or described Yeah, but in a way, I mean you are celebrating the the produce, correct? Because you know everything starts with the the the, the produce and but uh, there's different path that you can take. You can uh, overcomplicate things or you can simplify things and then you can let the produce shine, but still that the experience the experience for the consumers but as well all the like the, the you know the customer of the of the restaurant you know, is something really special. And this has been creating, you know, through, let's say, your fingers and the one from your, you know, your colleagues. So I, I'm surprised that, um, you know, creation is not like, a, you know, like a, a, the, the, the appropriate word for you, for you. I don't know what the appropriate word is. <laughs> When I, I see I, it from the outside, it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's a m- magical transformation, you know, that, yes. and that's, yes. that goes through, Based on you know your your past experience, the knowledge of uh, that you have acquired through all the years of um, you know of doing that that job, and you know the techniques that you have you know acquired. So, right, it's, it's I, pretty fascinating. I don't see it as a slight. I just see it as as I think that it's a slippery slope of the way in which culinary creativity is described, oftentimes in a very rosy kind of way, and. Well, well, I think that there's a, there's a lot of good in that. I think, I mean, for for me, it makes me feel uncomfortable sometimes to think of what I do as as something that's so special or so creative or or this or that. It's it's technique and it's responsibility and it's and it's trying to do the right thing with 
the relationships that you have with the people growing your food and with your staff. And doing this is, is as much an exercise in, in mentorship and teaching and, and anything as it is trying to get food but, on a plate. But, you know? but from your point of view, is there at least like a, a, an, an art component, you know, to it? On, on oh, sure. Of the, I'm, the craft? I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, telling on myself here because it's one of these things where if I think about it as this, this creative outlet for me or this part of, of, of my life that like, this is where I express myself creatively. It's dangerous for me to think that way because, you know, then I can get into this like tragic artist syndrome and this, you know, I'm so <laughs> terminally unique and, and, and whatever. And I really like to keep my feet like as firmly planted on the ground as I can. That's like the way that I can operate best is, is staying as true and humble to what my purpose is that I, that, as I can. I am an incredibly creative driven person in general. Yeah. You know, what you are saying is in fact that you are dropping your ego if there's any ego at the door. So there's, you know, there's no ego in the, in the process, which I think it's, it, it's, it's great, but there's still this creation, creativity approach and, um, you know, an art aspect of what you are doing. Well, it's a very intentional thing. You know, um, I think most people that are serious about cooking have had periods when they're coming up where they really have an inflated sense of themselves. And I was certainly <laughs> one of those people that was really trying to trying to do things that were far beyond my skill set and trying to be in places that I didn't belong. And think of myself in a way in which that I feel now was very disingenuous. And so I think it's just important to keep things in perspective is, I guess, what my overall point is. Yeah, this is. Uh, uh, agree. Understood. Uh, I I want to go back to the neighborhood classics and so on because I uh, you shared with me that um, you came up with um, like a great idea or you or like the the whole team. But the fact of that you you decided to keep those neighborhood classic in a separate menu from like the new menu and give that neighborhood classic a menu access to the people that were like the former like clientele of the you know of uh, of the restaurant. So I thought it was a pretty uh, pretty neat idea. Can you? Explain a little bit, you know, more in details to us. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a practical decision. You know, we don't want people that have supported this restaurant to feel excluded because we're, you know, changing and kind of modernizing and and looking to to what this restaurant's going to be for the next ten years or fifteen years or whatever. We we want them to still feel like that this is their place, while at the same time, when we have a, a lot of demographic shifting in in the restaurant and different clientele being attracted, I may not want our best foot forward presented them to be one of those dishes. I don't want them to think that chicken piccata or whatever is the best chicken dish that we could put on the menu for them. We make a great one <laughs> and, and it's certainly tasty and they'll really enjoy it. But, you know, there's other things that, that, that I feel like that we can do with those, with those ingredients that is really going to put us in a, in a better position as a restaurant and feel more cohesive in terms of a, a dinner, dinner menu. I have really strong feelings about restaurants having one page menus. So it makes the most sense for us to be able to compartmentalize that just a little bit to, to free up some space to do some more interesting things with fish, to do some more interesting things with other proteins, and to, to grow as a restaurant without excluding the, the folks that supported us before, before I came along. Okay. So how did you decide um, you know, on which new dishes to, um, to add? It's a, always a trial and error thing. You know, when you, you see a new product coming along on somebody's list, and it speaks to you or it jogs something in your memory or you want to you want to play with it you, you come in and you, you test out an idea and you know, taste it with taste it with the guys and make adjustments and you know before a couple of days it's ready for ready to get served the way that in which that I've I've been taught how to how to work through dishes uh, chef brock always had the pie theory product ideas and execution that's something that that was really important in our development as chefs and managers and thinking about food and thinking about fleshing out dishes and ideas is it starts with a product and you, uh, what, what is it about that that excites you? What is it that we need to highlight? What is it that we need to balance in that ingredient? What are we, what do we need to add to it to balance it out, to, to cut the acid, to, you know, add more acid, what, whatever it is. How do we then take the idea that we have of making this real well rounded thing? And make it executable 50 times in a night consistently, you know, <clears throat> and it follows, it follows that, that step-by-step -step process. I'm still very much a proponent of simplicity. I like for things to, to, to not have more than three or four ingredients in a total dish. I think a lot of, uh, once you get 
further past that, it's really things things starting to get lost. It's something that I've also noticed in a lot of people that that I've worked with uh, and worked for as they mature. Uh, it's all about you know pulling things back, trying to highlight what's what's there and instead of covering up with technique. I like to have things that appear really simple and it and, and tastes more complex and surprising. When you're able to hide the technique, I feel like that's that's much more special for the guest. So what is more important uh, for you, technique or creativity? I don't think you can properly express anything creatively without proper technique and fundamentals. Okay. Have you learned um, like the, the the fundamental techniques like based on uh, like a lot of chefs that I heard here in the US so from like uh, the French cuisine? Did you go like beyond this and to like, um, you know, other techniques coming from other, you know, parts of the of the world, like maybe from Japanese techniques or, you know, Korean cuisine or? Sure. I, I think, I, you know, self-study is, is, is has been an obsession of mine too. my entire career. I've, I've got a giant cookbook collection that I've carted around the country with me a few times. And, um, you know, I, I went to culinary school here here in Asheville and they those curriculums are are, are very traditional in terms of how they teach uh, classic European cuisine and mainly French in, in their in their course study. I, I don't believe that I, I gained a whole lot of technique knowledge. Most of mine was, you know, on, on the job. Staging or, yep, on jobs. Yep. Yeah, st- staging and, and, and working in, in restaurants. My experience is, I don't think anything has been completely traditional in in terms of what a purist might describe it to be. But I do think that fundamentals in terms of in terms of technique and how you treat things and how you treat your environment, how you treat, you know, alliums or, or store products or whatever, like those things are, are, are much more important than how to use, you know, whatever food additives that, that people still kind of mess around with and that kind of thing. You talk about like your, your creative approach, uh, you know, with the pie, you know, approach, but what are your, um, your sources of, uh, of inspiration? Well, I, I think it's all inspiration comes every, everywhere. You know, it's not it's not just uh, I'm constantly inspired by people in the industry and other places that uh, are doing things that I never thought of. When I see an ingredient combination that, that I haven't explored personally, it, it's something that I want to try or, you know, a, a fermentation of a product that I haven't that I haven't tasted before. You know, I, the the more I can build that catalog of flavor experiences the the easier it gets to kind of you know connect dots together in your brain about what might work and what might not and that kind of a thing outside of uh, of that like inspiration comes from nature a lot and from conversations with people and what excites them you know really inspires me a lot when i hear people tell stories about childhood nostalgia things and and hot dogs and <laughs> like things like that like anything that that uh, that sparks joy in others is, is okay. inspiring in some kind of way. Any inspiration coming from um, other art expression? Because uh, I know that you have, you know, you you know, in your family, there's a lot of uh, people, um, you know, in visual art, and then you were into music as well when you were younger. So I'm just thinking, you know, that's maybe a, an, a door for you to uh, to look at inspiration coming from you know other form of art. Sure. I don't think that that for me, inspiration from from visual art or from music directly translates into cuisine. I think it's more all tied together. My kitchen experiences are always much more full and joyous and satisfying when they're paired with music and lots of lots of different kinds that keep me in a steady groove throughout my day, throughout throughout whatever project it is that I'm working on. And uh, to give you a really good example, an artist in, based in the Bay Area, California, Rick Ho, he just recently sent me a print, an artist print of, uh, he's a photographer and a, and a video artist and stuff. And he had been following my career and really liked, it's, you know, had sent me a message saying that he'd love to be a regular at my restaurant and that kind of a thing. And sent me this beautiful piece that was, uh, that looks like Mars. It's, it's just a big circle that's red and textured and, said that he when he did this piece he thought of me and that it was just big sir and salt and thyme or the ingredients in it and it's really complex and really meditative and, and you know i never would i never would be capable of looking at that and distilling what it actually is but somebody somebody like that who has has his hands in you know is a, is a very 
interested food person like yourself and a creative person in, in his professional life, kind of putting those things together and, and joining those worlds together is really inspiring to me. I don't believe I'm on his level in terms of like my awareness and an ability to, to feel those things as intensely, but I'm certainly appreciative to be it. So what are your most uh, preferred ingredients to work with in each season? There's a lot. It's, it's hard to pick something uh, like one thing. Uh, if I had to, peaches in summer, uh, okra in summer, those are pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable. The, uh, the unseasonality of California always kind of throws things away for me in terms of how you think about that. Because, you know, Santa Rosa plums and, and pluots are like just the most delicious thing that I could think of, of any kind of product in any season. And they have those all, all the time. Spring, I would, I would say artichokes. There's something just really wonderfully meditative about turning artichokes and phrasing them properly. And I really enjoy I really enjoy that. Beans in the summer, all kinds of beans, uh, flagellate beans and cranberry beans and apples and chicories in the fall, sunchokes in the winter, radishes in the winter, I would say. And what's your latest ingredient obsession? I've definitely put mushroom pellets in a lot of food lately, scrambled eggs. So what, <laughs> what, what, what are like mushroom pellets? I'm, I'm not aware of, of like, especially the, um, the, you know, the pellets part. <laughs> so what, what do you mean by that? Well, it's a seasoning, and you can generally find them in most Asian grocery stores. It's okay. Really heavy. It's really high in natural glutamic acid. Okay. So it, it's deeply, deeply savory. So it's it's a great seasoning substitute for salt, and and it it really functions in a lot of the same ways without adding salinity, um, but it adds richness and it adds, uh, l like I said, that natural glutamic acid. So it, it makes you salivate. Let's go back, to, uh, you know, to uh, the restaurant and what you are, in fact, doing at the moment, something recent, something that you have called like the Sunday Supper Series. Can you explain to us what those uh, Sunday Supper Series are about? Yeah, it started John Buck and I. John used to be the chef at Haas Greenville and was, has been with Sean, for, was, with Sean for years in Charleston and then took over that new restaurant. They are currently reconcepting that space and So John's no longer with that company and he reached out to me and we, we thought that it would be a good idea to do some dinners together. We're really good friends and enjoy working together and think about food in a lot of the same ways. So we decided Sunday is a pretty slow sales day for us at the restaurant and that that would be a good day to do a pre fee kind of a style menu. And so we just put four of them in a row and just decided we would just see what happens. And I invited a couple other chefs that are here in Asheville to collaborate with him and me on these menus. And we've done two of them so far this coming up week. We're, uh, we're doing one with John Fleer, who's uh, the chef at Rhubarb and the Rue and Benny on Eagle here in Asheville as well. It is an opportunity for, for us to have some fun in a, in a year where there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for that. Provide an alternative dining experience to people who may have been craving a reason to go out, you know, There's not a lot of options if you want to go have a kind of a special occasion kind of a thing right now. It's an opportunity for us to scratch that itch a little bit, but also directly support the farmers that we normally would have been pouring a lot more resources into this year, but with you know lockdowns and restrictions have, have not been able to support them as much as we normally would like to. So how is um, the collaboration working practically? I'm going back to my creativity, sorry. <laughs> What collaboration here brings in the whole creative process? Is it uh, a collaboration around dishes? Uh, is it a collaboration around like a menu and everyone, each of you are doing, you know, each of you is doing like a, a different dish. So how, how does it work? Probably a naive question, but from, uh, you know, from a food enthusiast, I would say. Well, what's, what's different about it for, for John and I is, is, you know, we work so closely together that we can, we can really... Uh, we think of, uh, along the same lines in a lot of ways. So it, it made the most sense for us when we did the first one together that was just him and I, that we just collaborated on all of the dishes and just, we looked at what was available produce wise for that week from these farms that we um, wanted to feature and, and just pushed out a, a dish based on each court or each product kind of a thing. We had a, a, cel a really great celery 
that was coming from broken orc organics and traveler's rest and and that turned into a celery you know trout and apple dish you know with a lot of different celery components a vinegar and a, and a, and a fresh celery and celery leaves and celery root and, you know a couple of different ways and so since then like that's that's kind of been our mo is like let's start with the product let's start with what's going to be available that week brainstorm about it a little bit here's a move that i like to do with sun chokes here's a thing that i like to do with this or whatever and you know today we we had our meeting with with chef lear and that's what we did we sat around for two hours eating tacos and you know talking about what was happening that week with sprouting cauliflower and with chicories and from this farm and from this farm and we've followed the format that we set that was like five courses with a dessert and a welcome snack in addition to the five courses and each dish is something that that each of us that that we all kind of contributed something to conceptualizing it's not like i pack my cooler and i have my dishes and i come and i i execute them and you execute yours and then we you know shake hands and leave you know it's much more involved than that which I, to me is, is makes for a much richer experience on my side and also for our teams have you ever collaborated with um you know with other people behind uh, beyond like uh, chefs uh, outside of um, you know chefs in what kind of way I mean, I, I, you were talking about like uh, the the person who is a photographer, let's say, um, you know, and sending you this uh, this picture, or you know, I talk to other chefs uh, in uh, on the podcast in the, in the past, uh, you know, that maybe work with um, you know pastry chefs, and they are exchanging you know some um, knowledge and inspiring each other, or even some people working with um, ceramists, you know, and having you know, that uh, collaboration like this. So I'm, I'm just curious if... Uh... Sure. I think that I do that a lot more than I realize. And I just don't think of it that way because I'm a really open source guy. I don't believe in secrets in the kitchen. I believe that there's certain things about intellectual property that are valid, you know, but I'm not in a position to really determine what meaning that has right here as I sit here today. If somebody wants to know how to do something that I can do and they can't, then I feel that... I don't have a responsibility, but I, but I feel like that's a gift that I'm able to share with that person, whether they're in or out of the industry. And so I generally try to do that. I've also like, you know, paid visual artists and uh, salami to, to do graphic work for me and <laughs> things like that. So I guess you would call that so somewhat of a collaboration. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I, I, I think I do it a lot more than I realize. I just don't think of it that way. I want to go back to um, the work that you are doing with uh, the purveyors, you know, the farmers and the selection of um, of uh, the freshing produce that um, you're you're making, because you are, you say, featuring a lot of locally locally sourced ingredients on on the menu. So how how do you create a relationship, you know, with uh, those uh, purveyors? It's pretty hard when you're cold calling people which is kind of what my experience was like when I came back here in January. Yeah, sure. I, I, I set up a lot of meetings with, with everybody that I had on, on, on a list of some, some friends here that have, have run kitchens here about who was doing what now and spoke with all of them and visited a lot of farms. And unfortunately, just due to the timing of everything, I wasn't able to, to get on board with as many people as I wanted to before everything shut down and I had to retool everything again anyway. So it was, it was a much longer process this, this time than it usually is. But you generally, it's just getting, just like getting to know someone who's a friend, you, you start to learn what they're, what they're passionate about. And that makes you uh, inspired to, to treat what, what they're doing with the utmost respect that you can. When I go to a farm and, and see the kind of care that, that goes into getting a product to where it can come through my door, it makes the decision making process a lot easier about why that cost is justified and why the labor is justified on my part. And that that's always been the the kind of background of my mm -hmm. cooking experience. Everybody that I've worked for has had this approach. Okay. That's, that's direct. I haven't had to unlearn anything in terms of, you know, ordering from a from a, a spec sheet. You know what I mean? So are you meeting uh, usually with a lo lot of uh, small producers then? Yeah, uh, e either one-on-ones or, or at farmer's markets or, you know, s scheduling visits to go see their see their farm in their space and, and, and talk to them personally, face-to-face. -face. Okay. And, and you're originally enjoying the, the, you know, when they are bringing you 
you know, things like different things, like, um, you know, on different occasions, correct? Like things that are, you know, in the seasons or that are available, you know, on, the, on their farms. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the exciting things about cooking for me is, you know, getting a text message at 4.30 in the afternoon saying, hey, it's about to freeze tonight. Like I'm bringing a truckload of, of frilly mustard and, you know, some some lunchbox peppers that aren't going to survive the frost. I'm like, OK, well, <laughs> I guess we're, we're going to do a salad with mustard on it next week. You know? <laughs> OK, so that's, uh, that's how it goes. So where are your passions for salumi and uh, fresh pasta coming from? Um, well, salumi is something I've always loved. And I didn't, I didn't know what it was for a long time. As a kid, we had big holiday celebrations. And everybody get together for Christmas and stuff. And you'd, we'd have these big baskets with cheese balls and crackers and, and you know, candy and all this and, and a big log of summer sausage. And that was the thing that I would try to sneak away from everybody. You know, uh, I've always loved slim jerky, some, some, some gyms and beef jerky and all that kind of stuff, country ham and sausage. It's just fascinating to me oh, and delicious and always has been. I can remember the, the first time that I ever staged at McCready's when I was um, just, just starting out as a cook, being taken through and shown some of these things. It was really mind-blowing to me that these, th- these people were responsible for taking a, a, a pig from a just slaughtered state and turning it into all of these things. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it at the time, you know. But it was just the most fascinating thing to me that and, and it was so impressive and it solidified what what to me at the time, um, I was still really very much forming what my idea of the chef was, what that consisted of, of, you know, what kind of skill sets were required to call yourself that or whatever and, and being able to utilize a whole animal and, and, and turn it into all these magical things was, was definitely just something that I thought you needed to know to be a chef just like pastry. It was like, if you, it didn't seem fair to call yourself a chef if you can't work pastry as well, you know? So I didn't really get a chance to really go through all that stuff hands-on as in a real way and work, work through all that stuff until I started Hustle Nashville. Um, I, I had done some sausage making here and there and some pâtés and stuff, but I didn't really get that experience of, of doing it all from a whole animal okay. perspective until then. And for the pasta? For the uh, fresh pasta, pasta, I really didn't know anything about it until I started working at Quince. In San Francisco? In San Francisco, yeah. So I, I didn't even realize who Michael Tusk was until about six months after I started working there. One of my favorite cookbooks of all time is um, Cooking by Hand by Paul Mortoli. I think I'm on the fifth copy of that book that I've purchased because I've lent it out so many times and it's never been returned. <laughs> Paul and Michael, uh, Michael ran his kitchen in Oakland, um, Olivet, or Olivet, Oliveto, uh, excuse me if I'm saying that wrong. He was the chef of his restaurant when he wrote that book. And I didn't put those pieces together until, you know, I had been working fish station at Quince for six months. And there was just this reverence and magic about it that was a central part of the identity of this restaurant was handmade pasta. I didn't understand why it was special until I, you know, worked with the pasta guys. They had a, a three-man pasta team. Uh, there's a big wood board that faced faced the uh, the windows to the street. My station when I when I worked fish, but would share a right angle with them. We shared a, a, a sink. I would get to watch them work for the first couple hours of my day while I was butchering fish and making sauces and whatever. They would open a a new cart and a half and a half for their coffee every morning and stick it to my little boy. So by Thursday, I had like four or five of those things down there. Cecilia would always wave to any remotely attractive woman that passed by. And I just remember they were always smiling. They were always cracking jokes with each other and probably the most joyous people that I've ever been around in this business. My Spanish wasn't very good, still isn't very good, but it was okay enough to get me uh, moderate success in communicating with those guys. And the only way that you could learn how to make pasta at that restaurant was to come in at six o'clock in the morning and make pasta with them. So I did that a lot. Uh, sometimes I would do it on a day off. and Sometimes I would come in at six in the morning and, and work pasta until one o'clock when I had to break off and start butchering fish, you know, and then work service and do all that and, you know, leave it two thirty in the morning or whatever. There was just this, this love in it, you know, 
there was joy in it and it, that was like exuded by all of these people and such a such a reverence and a respect for it and being that we couldn't communicate with languages as, as easily as we could you know with amongst the amongst the cooks about details about technique or whatever the way that you know i had to learn was them showing me what it was and letting me do it and so i'm i'm, I'm a pretty tactile kind of learner anyway i learned i learned by doing so that that really helps just having that having that kind of experience to uh, monkey see monkey do kind of a thing sure and um i could make pasta for 12 hours a day for the rest of my life and still not come close to touching cecilia or renache so or what kind of pasta do you masters. like to uh to make them filled pasta is it's always my favorite to make by hand the tortellinis and anilotis and capolettis and uh you know mezzalun and all, all those kinds of dumplings that's where i feel like i i just have the most satisfaction of of working with my hands and are you doing them um let's say italian like really italian style and traditional or are you as well injecting some of uh you know your your roots or you know of like southern southern food i think that i follow traditional italian sensibility with some things but the ingredients are probably different you know we we've, we've done a, a cranberry or we we've, we've done a kale pasta a kale filled pasta at the restaurant for a while and when cranberry beans were in season we were raising cranberry beans and, and serving it with that pasta and then you know when they went out we we started using white acre rice peas because that's like what i would cook with with rice and you know hop and john and all that kind of stuff and it it eats just as well and it's it's um i don't think that, that being a i don't want to say slave to tradition but i i don't feel like that things need to be traditional to be special you can pay respect to tradition and and use different ingredients without it being kitschy or or sacrilegious in some kind of way you know So you you mentioned two names, you know, throughout the our conversation. Uh, one is uh, Michael Tusk, and uh, of course the other one is Sean Brock. So I, I want to switch a little bit the conversation around mentorship. So so I know you you work with um, you know Sean Brock. I mean you met him first at McCready's, and then you work with him at uh, you know Husk Nashville, and Michael Tusk at uh, Queens and Verju in in uh, San Francisco. And Joshua Askin is at uh, Saison as well, Saison in, uh, in, in San Francisco. So can, can you describe your experience working with those chefs and what you have learned you know, from them? You know, Sean, Sean's the biggest influence that I'll ever have. He's the first, he's the first person that allowed me to come in and see a real kitchen. The first time I ever stepped into McCready's, I, I was never the same after that day. You know, it just sparked me in, in the direction that, that it, I currently am still on. And I, I, I owe him uh, the biggest set of gratitude for that, for showing me what was possible. I met him at a wine dinner when I was working at, at Grove Park. And Grove Park's a you know big fancy resort, and everybody wears white paper toques and checkered pants and is <laughs> pressed and all this. And you know Sean comes in with a with a, a, a cornbread hat on and and an arm full of pickles and red bands. <laughs> and I'm like, who the fuck is this dude? And <laughs> how do I learn? more about what he's doing and i was just like i was enamored and then, and then when i went to to see his restaurant it was over you know i was just mm -hmm, like well mm -hmm. this is what i'm this is what i'm doing i don't fucking know anything you know i've got to work 10 times as hard as i as i have been to be the garbage cook here you know what i mean and that's what i had to do <laughs> but for him he's always been that person that's like if he ever called and said i need you for anything you know i would drop whatever i was doing to be there for him That's kind of how how uh, I ended up in in, in Nashville. Um, we we ended up connecting, and and um, there was a, a need and an opportunity for me to to be there for him. And I was really I was really grateful for that. I've always been a little ashamed of where I'm from and and who I am. I actively rejected the Southern accent and stuff when I was when I was growing up. It felt felt like I needed to run away from a lot of things, and he really taught me that that wasn't true. That You know who I am and what I am in my bones and where I come from is special, and that it, it deserves the same kind of scrutiny, deserves the same discipline as all the great cuisines of the world, and that pursuing what's inside of me and what I uh, what I grew up enjoying is just as valid as anything else. Apart from that, he's also taught me a lot about 
how much power there is in being vulnerable, learning how to ask for help and how to live a purposeful life in recovery. He's taught me through his actions what a, what a, a leader really looks like. Uh, he's been, uh, he has been like a really uh, uh, a figure, you know, for a lot of uh, chefs and, you know, beyond the, the industry about, um, you know, the whole steps that he has taken talking about addiction. So, and I think this is something that you have at heart. So uh, uh, I think that, uh, you, you know, you are part of uh, the band's friends group in, in Nashville. So um, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit uh, about what you are doing, uh, you know, there and your position about, you know, alcohol and drug addiction, you know, which sure. is still a, a big issue in the restaurant industry? Yeah, ab absolutely. I've been sober for three and a half years. It wasn't the first time that I got sober. <laughs> I went to rehab when I was in my, my early 20s and struggled a lot for a long time. And I never felt that I had any opportunity to share about my experience or, or ask for help. And as, as things kind of progressed in the restaurant industry and I, I became a lot more involved in, in higher end places and, you know, you, you, you really have this hard exterior and, and, you know, you can handle anything, this and that, and like, you know, mm -hmm. getting drunk after work is just part of the thing. And, you know, it's almost a rite of passage. It's almost a rite of passage. Sure. Sure. You know, I didn't want to be different. You know, mm -hmm. I, I had found, I'd found my tribe and I didn't want to be, to feel like an outcast again. Sure. An outcast in a, in a group of outcasts, you know, that's one of the loneliest places you can be as a person. I didn't want to do that to myself. So I, I kept drinking and I kept, you know, kept things inside. And so what I've learned in recovery is that where, where I get the transformation and I get, get all the good stuff is when I'm talking about and sharing the things that I don't want to, you know, that I want to hide from people and that I want to, to, to stay hidden for some version of myself that I want people to perceive me to be, um, to be what's outwardly available. And so when I was asked to, to, to be a part of the Ben's friends here, it made me think that if this was around, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe I wouldn't have had to go through all this. If, if I had known that there were people in the, in the industry, they were actively trying to support each other saying that it's okay to be, It's okay to be different. It's okay to pursue recovery. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to like, you know, do all these things about changing everything about, about your life. Like you can, you can still do what you love and, and live a purposeful life in recovery. I, I might, it might have saved me a lot of pain. You know, it's a really good opportunity for me to, to be of service to my community, to, to help people find that bridge to recovery that may not, may not have gotten, um, if, if it weren't for, you know, people in the hospitality industry connecting those dots. What would be your advice then for, uh, you know, chefs uh, or young cooks that are in, uh, in the situation that maybe you were, you know, several years ago back? Well, uh, you know, now <clears throat> um, you, we have Zoom, we have the internet, you know, you can go to, to the, the Ben's Friends website and find a national meeting that meets every single day and just listen. And a lot of people will, will probably be saying things that, Or worse than your experience and make you feel better about yourself <laughs> but also make you feel that that you're not alone and that's like the most important thing you're not alone and there's people out there that are that are willing to help and willing to listen so uh before we end up uh, the discussion with a series of rapid fire question i would like to pick up your brain i ask always chefs that are coming to uh, the podcast to uh, share maybe like um, a suggestion, let's say, how to, for home cook, someone, someone like me, uh, how they can create maybe a, for you like a pasta dish that would be uh, Andrew MacLeod like style, you know, and what, what unique spin would you suggest them to make? Well, w one that's a really easy kind of one pot deal or one pan deal that I, I like to do sometimes is, is uh, either farfalle or, you know, macaroni or whatever kind of dry noodle that you have laying around. To cook that and while you're doing that to render some sausage some breakfast sausage like hot spicy jake's breakfast sausage or something like that in a pan toss in some kale or some you know torn up collard greens or turnip greens or or whatever you have around and you know glaze that in the sausage fat drain off some of the some of the fat <clears throat> add a little bit of cream to the pan and toss your pasta with it and crush it with some parmesan cheese and bean herbs and lemon juice and that's a really like that's a really good standby you know If you've got 20 minutes, kind of a quick dinner or any, 
lunch meal or whatever kind of a thing. And uh, if we, you know, I would like to make a macaroni and cheese, for instance, a mac and cheese. So what, what, uh, what would be your suggestion? Hotly disputed mac and cheese thing in the South, right? You know, I grew up eating casserole mac and cheese that has eggs in it and all that. And a lot of people swear by it. But my, my version of mac and cheese that I love is gooey and stringy, you know. So for, for that, I would bring some milk to a boil take whatever grated cheese that I wanted to use and toss it in a really small amount of cornstarch. Uh -huh. And when that milk is boiling, stir it in the starch and the cheese are going to thicken right up and you just toss it over your buttered pasta and then eat it as soon as you can. Okay. Are you ready for the rapid fire questions? Yeah, I think so. So you and I are going on a tasting tour in Asheville. So what are like the five spots you will take me to? Except Avenue M. Of course, I've, I've been to Avenue M before that. Of course. Okay. We, we would probably go to Hendersonville first to go to Hot Dog mm -hmm. World and get slaw dogs and chili, chili cheese tater tots because that's my favorite restaurant. On oh, gosh. Yes. And their prices haven't changed since 1986. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that, that's, that's number one. Buxton Hall Barbecue would, would probably be number two. And um, any, anything that Elliot cooks would, uh, would be on my list. El Gallo uh, downtown where the table space used to be, that would be a really wonderful place to get a couple of tacos and um, anything else that Louise is cooking. Curate Tapas Bar would also be on that list. Either Zambra, another, another really great tapas restaurant that's a little less traditional, or Session, that new cafe that opened in the Citizen Vinyl space for a pastrami sandwich. What's your favorite guilty pleasure food? Sour Patch Kids. Or high chews, <laughs> really? or Starburst, <laughs> chewy fruit-based candy. Well, Welch's Welch's fruit yeah. snacks have the okay. best texture of any. <laughs> Very cool. So I I know one of the three because you already uh, shared that with us. Um, um, you know, and that's like you. I would like to know your three cookbooks that have in the the top when I inspire you the most. So you said already cooking by hand. So that's from you know one of the three. So what yeah, would be the two of us? I would say On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee is, okay, is a yeah. close number two. Probably The Joy of Cooking would be number three. Oh, wow. Okay. What's your biggest pet peeves in the kitchen? Beet juice. Beet juice? Anything that stains. Ex you, you have to explain to me. <laughs> any, anything that stains. Um, okay. And, and especially when, when, when people aren't thorough about cleaning up after themselves when, when they work okay. with things that stain. Like yeah, yeah. Juice. Makes sense. Makes Little sense. speckles of things. But, you know, standard things like, like floors not being swept and, and, and tape not being cut properly and, and that kind of a thing. Those are, those are pet peeves. Okay. Too, but. So in the last one, so beside the classics, what condiments, spices, sauces do you like to have on hand at home? What do you mean by the classics? I'd like, yeah, ketchup, like mustard and mayo yeah, kind of thing. Exactly. Yep. You got um, it. Uh, some, some kind of chili crunch sort of a thing. A fermented, fermented, chunky hot sauce of, of some type, for sure. I would also say, well, barbecue sauce. Yeah, barbecue sauce. Okay, and now I have to ask you, what style of barbecue sauce? Sweet Baby Ray's. Okay, cool. Chef, thank you very much for your time and the great conversation on uh, Flavors Unknown. I hope you had a good time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Emmanuel. It was great. Thank you for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Chef Andrew MacLeod. And you can find the show notes from this episode on the website flavorsunknown.com. Please share the podcast and tell a friend about it. My next guest will be Chef Misty Morris from Petra and the Beast in Dallas. And we will talk a lot about charcuterie and pasta. This week, I want to give again a shout out from a great forum, an educational resource for chefs called The Learning Chef. It is created by Chefs for Chefs, and they have a fantastic Facebook page and Facebook group, The Learning Chef. Please check it out. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.